we are finally here. The final message, what I plan to be the final message, in uh, this series on the book of Revelation. And I just love the book of Revelation. It is powerful and it is very relevant to our lives. And um, so we are looking at some material in the last chapter, uh, especially related to God's word and also to God's grace. More specifically, we'll be looking at the last of four mega themes. Uh, so when I was studying the last chapter, uh, what I noticed is that um, it brings up all of these big themes uh, that are seen not only throughout the book of Revelation, but actually throughout the entire Bible. We see these themes, um, and, uh, and they're all tied together, and they're woven together beautifully in the book of Revelation, and it makes the whole Bible so harmonious uh, when, when you see things like this. Uh, one of the many reasons that I believe that the Bible, uh, while it is the work of many different people writing over many centuries from different locations, I believe it is also uh, the Word of God, uh, the, the inspired by Him. And in fact, that will be one of the main topics. So let's uh, go ahead and read our passage, Revelation 22, beginning in verse 6. Then he said to me, These words are faithful and true. And the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, has sent his angel to show his slaves what must quickly take place. Look, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. When I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who had shown them to me. But he said to me, Don't do that. I am a fellow servant with you, your brothers, the prophets, and those who keep the words of this book. Worship God. Then he said to me, Don't seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, because the time is near. Let the filthy still be filthy. Let the righteous go on in righteousness. Let the holy still be holy. Look, I am coming soon, and my reward is with me to repay each person according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter the city by the gates. Outside are the dogs, the sorcerers, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to attest these things to you for the churches. I am the root and descendant of David, the bright morning star. Both the spirit and the bride say, Come. Let anyone who hears say, Come. Let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires take the water of life freely. I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his share of the tree of life and the holy city, which are written about in this book. He who testifies about these things says, Yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with everyone. Amen. Heavenly Father, I pray that you will speak to us through your word again, encouraging everyone who listens uh, and, and watches this video and uh, uh, helping to uh, strengthen us to live for you and to walk and talk with you and to know you and to make you known to others and guiding us. Uh, thank you, Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, amen. So I want to begin by looking at this statement here in verse 6. These words are faithful and true. And this is mega theme number 9. We've already covered the first eight in previous messages. And this theme is that the Bible is God's word. Now, strictly speaking, Jesus may have been specifically referring to the book of Revelation here when he says uh, these words, because we have to remember that uh, the New Testament was not uh, collected yet. Uh, parts of it may have been already in the process of being collected, like Paul's letters, uh, 
We don't know the details of that. Maybe even the, 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 the four Gospels by the time Revelation was written may have been uh, collected. But there wasn't a whole collection uh, that people would have called the New Testament combined with the Old Testament. And so when Jesus says these words, it's true that in the context of the book of Revelation, that this would have referred to the book of Revelation itself. Yet, what he says about it, what he says about the book of Revelation, is also true of the whole Bible. Um, so many people make claims, assertions, and promises that turn out uh, to be not true. So he's claiming that these words are faithful and true. Uh, and we understandably become cautious about what and who to believe. And Revelation makes all these huge uh, predictions about how the world is going to turn out and what's going to happen to people who follow God faithfully when it's hard to do so and what's going to happen to people who don't and uh, how do we know all of these things are going to be true. Uh, Jesus asserts that these words are faithful and true. We can base our life on this and if you are following Jesus uh, there are going to be times for many Christians well, basing your life on the truths that are in Revelation and in the whole Bible, and they and it's the same truths. Um, uh, yeah, maybe some of the details change, but the, 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 the big truths are the same. Uh, it's going to be costly. It could cost you popularity. It could cost you economically. It could cost you your job. It could cost you relationships, even your family. It could even cost you um, physical persecution. Uh, it could even cost you your life. So it's important uh, for us to know if these words are faithful and true. If they are faithful and true, it's worth it to lose relationships. We don't want to, but but if that happens, it's worth it to uh, lose out economically. It's even worth it to lose our life because if these words are faithful and true, and I certainly believe they are, then uh, what we are going to gain by following God is eternal life in a perfect world. So uh, Jesus is assuring us that these words are faithful and true, and he's going to tell us why this is the case. Uh, so he says, and the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets. Now, uh, sometimes things are worded in a way in Revelation that's not quite as clear as it is in some other parts of the Bible, um, but uh, it's worded in a way that, that, that speaks to our hearts as well. Um, so we can trust the words in the Bible because God has inspired the prophets. I believe that's what it means when it says he, he, he's the God of the spirits of the prophets. He is directing his prophets what to write. And this would include, now notice it says the prophets. This is, this is a hint that even though uh, what Jesus said about these words are faithful and true is specifically for the book of Revelation, it does have broader application to the whole Bible. It's not just one prophet, but the, the God is uh, in charge of the spirits of the prophets so that when they are writing, they are writing the word of God. God has inspired the prophets, uh, the authors of the Bible, to write these words, to write the words of God. The Bible, and we see this in other places in the Bible as well. First Peter chapter one, beginning in verse twenty. First of all, you should know this: no prophecy of Scripture comes from one's own interpretation, because no prophecy ever came by the will of man. Instead, men spoke from God as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So, when we are reading the Bible, uh, even though uh, it may the specific part we're reading may have been written by Moses or David or Isaiah or uh, Matthew or Mark, or in this case, John. Uh, but, but they were not just writing on their own. The Holy Spirit was inspiring and guiding them in what they wrote. We also see this in 2 Timothy. Uh, all scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Uh, again, the, the Bible is inspired by God. Uh, look at what it says in Acts 28. Disagreeing among themselves, they began to leave after Paul made one statement. 
the Holy Spirit correctly spoke. So, so Paul is saying that the Holy Spirit is saying something through the prophet Isaiah to your ancestors when he said, go to these people and say, you will listen and listen yet never understand. You will look and look yet never perceive. And what Paul is saying is, yes, this was written by a human named Isaiah, but it was the Holy Spirit speaking these words through him. And there are many other examples where the New Testament authors treat the Old Testament as God's word and throughout the whole Bible where the authors of the Bible claim to be inspired by and speaking for God. Uh, so why should we believe that this is true? They're all making these claims. Well, that's a, that's a huge topic. I'm just going to mention that there, we do have a lot of reasons to believe this other than just they say so. Um, I already mentioned the internal harmony of the Bible, how it all fits together, uh, fulfilled uh, prophecies. Uh, and then in the New Testament, we have apostolic authors. All of the books of the New Testament are either written by an apostle or by someone who is in close association uh, with an apostle so that uh, the early church believed that uh, their writing was approved of by an apostle. And, and why is that important, that apostles uh, wrote or approved of the writings in the New Testament? Well, not only did they themselves see Jesus risen from the dead, but God worked many miracles through them, um, a, 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 amazing miracles, lots of uh, a, amazing miracles, um, showing that God was with them and working through them and speaking through them. And then also all of the apostles were willing to face danger and take risks. Church history says that uh, most of them ended up being martyred. Most of them were killed for their faith. Um, we have recorded in the Bible itself the sufferings that some of them faced. And, and they were willing to suffer for the message they were sharing, which shows that they themselves really believed that the message was uh, true. And so so there's a, a lot of reasons, and these are not all of the reasons. This is just a sample of reasons to, to believe that these claims, that the Bible is the Word of God, that these are true claims. These are claims we can take to the bank. Okay, and we just talked about the apostolic authors and how important they are. And speaking of apostolic authors, uh, in verse 8, he, uh, he writes, I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And that's important because uh, John is one of these apostles. He was chosen by Jesus, verified by God through miracles and through his willingness to suffer for the gospel. And so uh, we can uh, believe that what he wrote uh, isn't just his own ideals, but that it comes from God. So because the Bible is the word of God, it is vital that we do not take away any of the words or add any words to it which is what it says uh, here later in the chapter. I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of this, uh, the book of this prophecy, God will take away his share of the tree of life in the holy city, which are written about in this book. So because... Uh, this is a book from God. It's very important that we treat it as the precious word of God, not add to it, uh, not take away from it, and prayerfully seek to understand it and humbly seek to understand it and also to live by it. One of the previous mega themes is that we are blessed when we keep the words of the prophecy, meaning that we we base our lives what on what is written in the book of Revelation and throughout the Bible. So uh, before moving on to mega theme number 10, um, it will help to briefly look at a verse which sometimes causes confusion and sometimes it's wrongly interpreted. So uh, we're shifting gears here and we're, and we're going to move to another topic, but uh, I want to look, I, I have not, even though this, this series on Revelation has been cr quite long with, I believe, a little over 50 um, messages, there are still quite a few details I did not have time to cover, but I do want to cover uh, this detail. It's a verse that often I think people interpret incorrectly. So uh, 
Here it is. Verse 15 is the main one, but let's start in verse 14. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter the city by the gates. Outside are the dogs, the sorcerers, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. Uh, so these are people who do not believe the Bible is God's word. We were just talking about the Bible is God's word. Uh, these people love something else. They love falsehood. Um, and, and their lives show it. They're, it gives a sample of some of the different types of immorality they're uh, involved with. And, um, and then uh, it says that they are outside. Well, what are they outside of? Well, right above it, this is why I included verse 14, it talks about entering the city by the gates. And that city is, of course, the New Jerusalem. So they are outside of the New Jerusalem. So what does this mean? And this is where I think some people have come up with some wrong interpretations. Um, some people imagine this means that unsaved evil people will be hanging out on the new earth, but outside of the new Jerusalem. So there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. Uh, some people might just call that heaven, which is fine, as long as you remember that heaven is well. Uh, God lives, and once uh, the new heaven and the new earth, uh, uh, once everyone is there, and after the resurrection, heaven and earth are going to be the same place. God is going to be living with us. And so, because it says that these people are outside of the new Jerusalem, they imagine that, uh, okay, inside the city, there's only going to be God's good saved people, but outside, there's going to be the, these people who reject God and and don't trust in Jesus, and they're bad people. They they do immoral things uh, on the new earth. And if you took this verse uh, out of context, and you didn't think about what the, the context of the whole Bible, or even the immediate context of this chapter, I can see why somebody would think this. Now, what would these people be doing while they were hanging out on the new earth? Um and this is a view I do not agree with. I just want to share it with you uh, because you might hear it, and I want to explain why I think it's wrong. So there's there's two there's at least two different ideas about what the people the unsaved people are doing out, outside of the city. Um, some people think that this refers to unsaved people who are hanging out in the lake of fire, hanging out. I mean, they they would be trapped in there. They wouldn't be happy about being there, obviously being tormented forever. So we might, uh, if you're a Christian, you're resurrected, you're living in the New Jerusalem, and we're, we're allowed to go in and out of the gates. They're always open. And uh, you might walk outside, and there's the lake of fire, and there's some of the people who were your neighbors and friends on earth who aren't saved. And and, and, and maybe this is a million years from now, and it's like, wow, they're still uh, screaming in agony, and, and, and that's going on forever and ever. I, I don't think that's what this means, but some people do think this is what that means. Others think that these people, these 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 people who don't love God, uh, they think that they are living outside the gates, but that they can still come to faith in Jesus, and then they too will be allowed in. So they're they're out there, but God is still working to try to win them to faith in in Jesus. And outside of the city, their life is not. Uh, anywhere near as happy. In fact, it may be full of a lot of grief and suffering, um, a type of hell. Um, but uh, there is still hope for them to realize that they were wrong to reject Jesus and to come to see the goodness of God and to choose to come inside. And so this view would be held by, uh, by people who are universalists or at least hopeful universalists. And I think they're wrong. I, I, I don't think that view is correct. But it's driven by this, this verse 15, which talks about outside, outside of the New Jerusalem. And so people think, okay, well, there must be people outside there on the New Earth. Um, and, 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 and I think that they're getting it wrong, and I will explain why. I think both of those interpretations are wrong. Let me explain what I think this does mean. Um, so here we go. Remember that while the New Jerusalem may be a literal city, 
And I lean towards thinking it, 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 it is that it will be in the age to come in John's vision. In John's vision, it is first and foremost a symbol f for what? For the people of God, for the church. Um, so it's just like the lambs in the Old Testament were really lambs, literal lambs that you could have touched, petted, um, but they were more importantly symbols of Jesus, the ultimate lamb of God who would die for our sins. Um, I think that this may be talking about a real city, uh, but most importantly, and this is very clear in the vision, that this city is symbolic of the bride of Christ. The bride of Christ is the church. It's, it's all Christians. It's all people who, who believe in uh, Jesus and are going to have eternal life and live forever. That's what it's symbolic of. And so, uh, so this verse is saying that there are immoral people who love falsehood who are not part of the people of God. They are outside of the church. I'm not talking about you, just your local church. In fact, uh, churches today may have some people who are not truly saved in them. A, a lot of churches probably do. So I'm not talking about a local church. I'm talking about the universal church, the body of Christ. But there are people in the world who love falsehood and they're living immoral lives and they are not part of the people of God, but the key question is when? What time frame is this verse talking about? Uh, so this verse, in, I believe this verse is not talking about the future when we will be living in the new heavens and the new earth. It is talking about right now in this current age. It would have applied back when John was alive uh, and, uh, and, and he was writing the book of Revelation and it would apply for all of the almost 2,000 years since then up to today. Uh, so why do I think this? Um, well, let me show you. So here is the whole 22nd chapter of Revelation, and uh, you probably can't read that too well, uh, but um, I want to show you the whole chapter for a reason. So the first five forces are still talking about the age to come, and most of chapter 20 and 21 are all talking about what's, what's going to happen and what, what is it going to be like after we are resurrected, the final judgment, and then going into um, eternal life, and there's going to be no more sorrow, and there's going to be no more evil, and God is going to be with us, all those wonderful things. And it's still talking about those things up to verse 5. I kind of feel like it would have been better to split the chapter uh, at verse 6. Remember, the chapter numbers and the verse numbers were not inspired by God. They were added a long time after the Bible was written. Um, so up to verse, up through verse 5 is talking about the future, the age to come. Uh, but um, then starting in verse 6, and I believe all the way through the end of the chapter, it's, it's not talking anymore about the future. It goes back to talking about today. It's kind of like uh, the vision... The part of the vision that was about what's going to happen after we're resurrected, it's over. And now Jesus is, is, is talking to John and he's bringing him back to today uh, in his time, but it would still be relevant for us today to talk about some things in the closing words. For example, three times in this end part of uh, Revelation, Jesus says, I am coming soon. Well, that wouldn't make sense if he was still talking about what's going to happen after we are resurrected because uh, he would have already have kept come. Uh, so, so Jesus is taking us back to the current day. Uh, he says, I'm coming soon. I'm coming soon. I'm coming soon. And right in the middle of all this, I'm coming soon is when we get these two verses that I was just looking at, including the one that says outside, outside are the dogs, the sorcerers, the sexually immoral, the morals, the idolaters and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. So I think he's saying that that's, what, that's the situation now, not outside of a literal New Jerusalem that isn't here yet, but outside of what that symbolizes, the bride of Christ, the people of God. There's capital C church. There are people who are outside of it. And uh, so there are people outside of the body of Christ right now today. And by the way, 
there's more evidence in those verses that he's talking about the current age in the last part of the chapter. I'm just, you can read through it, and I think you could find some more evidence yourself. So, so he's saying right now, today, there are people outside of the body of Christ. They are rejecting God's truth and living immoral lives. Uh, we see something uh, uh, similar referred to outsiders in Colossians chapter 4. Uh, at the same time, pray also for us that God may open a door to us for the message to speak the mystery of the Messiah for which I am in prison, so that I may reveal it as I am required to speak. Act wisely toward outsiders, making the most of the time. Your speech should always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you should answer each person. So Paul is praying uh, for opportunities to share the gospel. He's talking about sharing the good news of the Messiah, which is uh, the same word as Christ. And, and, and he's in prison because he's been sharing the gospel. And, 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 he, and now he's telling the Colossians that they too should be wise when they're talking with outsiders, people who are not yet Christians, because they should seek opportunities to do what? To help win them to Christ. It's not too late. These people are outside, but they don't have to stay outside. If they're still alive and if Jesus hasn't come back yet, they can still become come inside. So he say, look for opportunities to to win them to Christ. I believe that's what he is talking about here. And then in 1 Corinthians 6, 11, he says, and some of you used to be like this. And if you read the previous verse, You'll see he's talking about the same thing that is mentioned here in verse 15 of Revelation uh, 22, that some of you used to be sinful and you used to be God's enemies, uh, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of uh, our God. And this says, hey, um, uh, there's hope for people who are outside and rejecting God and living sinful lives. They can get saved. How, how can they get saved? And is Revelation talking about this? Well, yes, I'm convinced that it is. Look up in verse 14. Blessed are those who wash their robes. Why did they need to wash their robes? Uh, because they were dirty, dirty and filthy with sin and immorality. And all of us were like that before we were saved. Um, but, but we can be washed. We can be washed by the blood of Jesus. This happens when we believe in Jesus, when we trust them as our Lord and Savior. And it's a symbolic way of talking about our sins being forgiven. So yes, I believe in Revelation 22, 14 and 15. Uh, verse 15 is not at all talking about what is it going to be like after we are resurrected. It's talking about, Jesus is talking about what it's like right now there are people who need to be saved. Right now there are people who are living uh lives full of uh, filthy, gross sin, and they're rejecting God. But they can, they can come to Jesus and get their robes washed, and they can be clean, and they can be saved. Uh, so, making theme number 10 is your sins can be washed away. You can be forgiven, no matter how badly you've sinned. Uh, think about Paul. He... he uh, had, he was involved in having Christians killed for being Christians. But his sins were washed away, so completely washed away that he could become an apostle and, and serve Jesus. Your sins can be washed away too. Uh, big sins, little sins, uh, lots of sins. All of our sins can be washed away. We can be forgiven. Hallelujah. Like all the other mega themes, this one is found throughout the whole Bible. God is a God who's willing to forgive sins and cleanse us. Uh, Psalm 32, how joyful is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. When you understand, uh, uh, when we understand how, how terrible our sin was and what we deserved as a result of it, and then we find out the good, good news that, that God will forgive our sins and wash it away. Oh, hallelujah, that should fill you with joy. If it doesn't fill you with joy, either your sins haven't been forgiven because you haven't trusted in Jesus. Or you don't understand what happened. You don't understand how wonderful this is. We should be joyful because our sins are forgiven. Jeremiah, uh, uh, God is speaking and he says, I will purify them from all the wrongs they have committed against me. Thank you, God. 
I would have no hope if it wasn't for this promise, and neither would you. It continues, and I will forgive all, all. I will forgive all the wrongs they have committed against me, rebelling against me. He's willing to forgive the type of people he describes in verse 15. Immoral, filthy people who love lies and hate the truth. If they come to him, if they repent, if they hear the gospel and believe it, they can be forgiven just like I was forgiven and you, you have been forgiven if you are a Christian. Uh, now closely related to this is the wonderful truth that we don't have to pay the cost for this cleansing and for this forgiveness. Uh, so Revelation twenty two seventeen, let the one who desires take the water of life freely. The water of life is symbolic of being connected to God, having a good relationship with God because our sins have been forgiven. And now we have this water of life that gives us eternal life, just like the tree of life gives us eternal life. But these are, uh, they may be real things in the new heavens and new earth, but they are most importantly symbols of God who is the ultimate source of life and of eternal life. And look how much it costs us. It's free. And that's good, good news because if it wasn't free, we could never we could never pay for it. Do you think you could afford to pay for eternal life? I couldn't afford to pay for it and neither could we pay for our own sins. So mega theme number 11 is that salvation is free to us. That doesn't mean it was free to God. It cost God a lot, didn't it? Seeing Jesus mocked, spit on, beaten, crucified, and dying for you and me. It was very, very expensive for God. But it's free, freely given to us. Salvation is by grace. We cannot earn it. We could never afford it. We do not work to get it. There's no amount of work we could do to earn eternal life or to make up for the sins we've committed. Praise God, salvation is free to us, but it is not cheap. It's valuable. It's expensive. It can't, the, the cost is the blood of Jesus that was shed for you and me. In Ephesians, it says, for you are saved by grace through faith. And this is not from yourself. It is God's gift. It's a free gift. Not from works. You can't walk, walk for it. You can't earn it. So that no one can boast. Uh, so the Holy Spirit and the church, that's us. We are calling people who are outside to believe God's truth and accept his grace and come on in. This is what it means at the beginning of verse 17. Both the Spirit and the bride say, come. Let anyone who hears say, come. Let the one who is thirsty come. So, there's people who are outside, they're not saved yet, and the Holy Spirit is working to draw them so that they can come on in and get this free uh, 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 gift from God and be forgiven and get washed and get cleansed. And the bride, the Holy Spirit is working through us, the bride. That's the same thing as the New Jerusalem. It's talking about Christians, you and me. We are working together with other Christians and drawing people to Christ by telling them God's truth, by telling them the good news, and also by loving them, showing them God's love so they are attracted to Jesus and they come on in and they get saved before it's too late. Uh, so we have a work to do, but it's happy work to do as we invite people to salvation. So, um, now, once you come on in, once you come into uh, this wonderful, glorious salvation, you will find out that there is hope for the future. He who testifies about these things says, Yes, I'm coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. This world isn't going to go on forever the way it is, full of evil, suffering, death, pain, disappointment, disgorging, uh, sickness, decay. These things are temporary. For God's people, Jesus is going to come back and we are going to be resurrected, immortal, incorruptible, in a world without sin or suffering forever and ever. Hallelujah. There's hope for the future. And there is also grace for today. Because we do need uh, hope for the future. But we also need grace to make it to, make it to that future. Um, I do like to think about uh, the future and what's coming. But lots of times I'm like, God, I am so thankful that that future is promised. 
but I need help to get through today. I need help doing this task that I need to do that uh, it's difficult for me to do it. Either I'm scared or I'm, uh, I, I lack confidence or, I, um, uh, or I, oh, I'm not sure what I'm doing. Or, uh, and, 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 and God, I need grace uh, to, 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 to uh, make it through this day. And I need grace because of my own weaknesses. And I need grace because even though I don't want to sin, I still do. I need your grace. I need your mercy. I need your favor. I need your help uh, every day to make it through each day. There's hope for tomorrow. There's grace for today. Hallelujah. Uh, uh, all of Paul's letters begin and end with this ideal. All of these mega themes are found in other parts of the Bible, which is why I call them mega themes. Um, so here's just one example. You could you can look through uh, Romans and First and Second uh, Corinthians and Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians and Colossians and First and Second Thessalonians and First and Second Timothy and uh, Titus and Philemon. All of them uh, uh, begin and end with a blessing of grace. I'm just going to show you one example. Second Corinthians thirteen thirteen. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. This idea that um, the authors of the Bible are, are telling us things that we need to know. They're encouraging us. They're strengthening us. Sometimes they're correcting us because we need correction. I'm thankful that God doesn't let me stay messed up, that he, 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 he's, he's fixing me through his word. And uh, sometimes it's rebuking us. And, and we need all these things. But then we also need God's help. We need his mercy. We need his grace. We meet, need his strength to make it through another day. So... Mega theme number 12, there is hope for the future and grace for today. So let's close out this message and the whole big series on the wonderful book of Revelation by reviewing these 12 mega themes. God is the source of life, and that includes eternal life. And if we have a relationship with God as our Heavenly Father through Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we will have eternal life. God reigns and he will reign forever. All of his plans are going to come true. Um, everything he wants to happen is going to happen. He is going to succeed. He never fails. There will be no more evil. A day will come when all the evil will be gone and everything that's left will be good. Um, nothing bad will ever happen again. Hallelujah. Number four, we will be God's people. Uh, if you are a Christian, you will be God's people. Those who are not God's people, uh, they may not have realized it, but they belong to the devil, and, the, and they are going to get put in the lake of fire and burned up. Number five, uh, following God's revealed will brings blessings. When we uh, read the way that God wants us to live in the book of Revelation and throughout the whole Bible, and then we actually live according to it, that brings blessings to us. And also blessings through us for other people. Number six, we should worship God and no one else. We should worship God. That includes uh, bowing before him, submitting to his will, doing things his way, loving him, adoring him. Uh, and then the last six, uh, Jesus is awesome. <laughs> that sounds simple, but it is powerful. And when you believe it and when you know it, it changes how you think, how you live. It changes your priorities uh, it changes everything about your life. Jesus is coming back. Uh, we need to be ready for that. And when he comes back, it's going to be Judgment Day. Uh, those of us who are saved look forward to it because it will be the end of all evil and the beginning of uh, joy forever. Uh, those who are not saved do not look forward to it. It's going to be a terrible, terrible, terrifying judgment for them. The Bible is God's word. We can trust it. We can believe in it. And we should live our lives based on it. Number 10, your sins can be forgiven. People who are outside, people who are living in rebellion to God, they can be forgiven and they can get in. Now, in this age, there's still opportunity for them to be saved before the day of judgment when it will be too late. Uh, salvation is by God's grace. It was very costly for God, but it's free. You don't have to work for it. You don't have to earn it. And number 12, there is hope for the future and grace for today. Hallelujah. What a great book. What a great God we have. Oh, Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for the book of Revelation that speaks to our hearts through these powerful images. Lord, it's hard for us to understand it all, 
but we can understand enough to be strengthened by it and to be encouraged by it and to be taught to keep following you even in a world full of opposition, even if the government opposes us and persecutes Christians, uh, even when we're tempted by the world, even in the midst of false religions, we can stay true to Jesus because you're going to help us. And it's so worth it to do that. And Lord, we believe that you are real and we believe that you are going to reward those who live for you and stay faithful to you and believe in you and have faith in you. God, I pray that you will bless people through this message and through the wonderful, glorious book of Revelation and the whole Bible. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.